This week's topic is HF uh, HF Radio Overview. And Dan Presley is going to talk a little bit about um, this very broad topic. And then uh, after about 30 minutes, we'll actually kind of uh, open it up to any and all questions, either HF Radio or just general radio in uh, general radio questions. Dan, are you there? Yes. <laughs> just just finishing up a few bites here. Oh, no problem. <laughs> All right. Uh, do we want to wait? Do we want to give you another couple minutes? We can always uh, kill time. Yeah. Hey, Max, why don't you go ahead and just, just kind of give them the very vaguest overview, and I'll jump in here in about two minutes. Yeah, absolutely. And right. Marino? So there's a lot of um, questions and answers that were covered in the um, technician test on HF radio. So I don't want to go over those too much because if you've already taken the test, you either already know them or you know where the reference is. So for example, the different ionospheric layers that um, bend the radio wave back down to earth for skip propagation. Um, and I think that there's also some discussion about VHF, UHF ducting, where the um, radio wave will go up into the ionosphere and kind of bounce between two layers. Um, so what I'll kind of cover a little bit here, I think uh, a couple of topics. One is going to be like if you're interested in HF radio and you kind of want to know which what is a good radio to start with, we can cover a little bit of that and the cost because the cost is certainly gonna be um, considerably more than just picking up a $20 Baofeng off of eBay, which is just the all in one package. You have your battery, your antenna, um, your radio tuner, so to speak. Um, it doesn't have to be. Uh, so your first radio that you, your first HF radio that you buy doesn't have to cost a thousand, two thousand dollars. Um, certainly can, and that'll be a very nice radio. Um, once swap meets start, uh, Get going back up, what you'll be able to kind of see what's the new stuff for sale because the, you'll see vendors from ICOM, Kenwood, and Gesu there, and they will show you what all their latest and greatest radios are. <clears throat> One great thing about this hobby, though, is the equipment that amateur radios use doesn't really ever go out of date. So Dan might even talk a little bit about his boat anchors, which are decades, if not centuries old, um, that still work very well today. Um, that being said, though, uh, there's certainly a good way to get into HF radio for under three to $400 um, with some used gear that works perfectly well. And then just the other consideration is that not only do you have the radio to think about, but also the antennas, which tend to be a lot bigger than VHF, UHF antennas. I wish that... Um, there were some simple antennas that you could just put up on a, like a rubber duck or something like that. And there are, but some of them are what are called kind of compromise antennas where you, you trade off efficiency for portability. So mm -hmm. with that, I think I'm going to hand it to Dan sure. if you're ready. Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, Let's see, and just, just to kind of get the ball rolling to make sure that everybody understands what we mean uh, by HF radio, high frequency radio. Uh, now, I'll, I'll try to keep the history to a minimum, but uh, basically, you know, like we, some of you may know, our hobby is well over 100 years old. Uh, and, you know, uh, amateurs really started experimenting with radio back in the, well, 1880s, 1890s um, with, you know, simple, extremely simple technology. And uh, what, what happened uh, during those early years, right around the turn of the 20th century, let's say from 1890 to World War I, um, uh, the Excuse me, you're sick. Okay, eat too fast. Uh, anyway, uh, this, the part of the spectrum, uh, the radio spectrum that was most active and used uh, by uh, amateurs and all other services was what we would now call 
low frequency communication. In other words, you're probably familiar with the broadcast band, the old AM broadcast band, you know, 550 to 1600, I guess it's now 1700 kilohertz. Almost all the activity was below 550 uh, because there was a belief that uh, that was the band that would travel the most distance. Uh, you'd have a longer wave and it would propagate a long distance. Uh, and it was some, uh, without getting too scientific, there was some truth to that in some situations. And a lot of it depended upon uh, having a very high powered radio stations and, and uh, antenna arrays that I think you might be amazed today. You know, you might have like a dozen antennas 400 feet high. And, uh, you know, and you could be heard over a great distance. Uh, but a lot of that, of course, was out of the hands of the amateurs, except for maybe a few wealthy people. Anyway, uh, so a lot of the uh, commercial communication of the time, which would have been like uh, the Navy was a particular user of, of radio, in addition to amateurs and other services, um, were in those frequency ranges. So along comes World War I. What happens is uh, all amateur radio was shut down and kind of a national defense issue. So, uh, and it, it was also not a great deal of regulation. It was all kind of like the Wild West, kind of like the early days of the internet. You know, there wasn't much, uh, you know, in terms of regulation. So what happened uh, after World War I, uh, there was a struggle to get amateurs back on the air. Amateurs organized into uh, the organization we now call the ARRL, Amateur Radio Relay League. So they organized, they lobbied Congress, uh, they got back on air. Well, uh, the Navy in particular said, we don't want those amateurs around. And in point of fact, the amateur gear was usually better than the Navy gear <laughs> and worked much better and amateurs were much better communicators and so the Navy was kind of jealous about that. He said, well, we're going to kick you guys out of our frequency range. We're going to give you this useless set of frequencies uh, uh, above the broadcast. Band. Okay, starting at like 1700 kilohertz uh, all the way up to 30 megahertz, which is now kind of what we would call the 10 meter band. Um, so that was the deal. Well, amateurs being amateurs and industrious, they started researching these frequencies. And lo and behold, uh, as it turned out, these HF frequencies had uh, fantastic capabilities to communicate over much longer distances with much lower power, much simpler antennas and uh, simpler equipment than the low frequencies. And so the amateurs kind of grabbed the ball and ran with it. And in fact, uh, this year, 2021, is the 100th anniversary of amateurs uh, spanning the Atlantic Ocean, uh, who were the first, aside from Arconi, uh, to do it. And there's still some debate about that. Uh, but what happened is the uh, Radio Relay League sent some of their best people to Europe uh, particularly like Scotland and England, and they had some of the best stations over in the United States. And it did these series of tests uh, and showed, in fact, that they could communicate uh, very effectively, you know, uh, across the Atlantic Ocean. So after that, everybody started exploring the HF bands much more. And pretty quick, they were communicating all over the world, you know, with uh, relatively low power, and relatively simple equipment. And uh, that kind of kicked, kicked the door open and everybody else, you know, including the military, uh, commercial services, and everybody else started uh, coming in. Um, so uh, that's, that's just kind of the, the brief history. There's, you know, there's a lot more we can talk about that. So until um, I would say probably until like the late 1950s, the 1960s, 
99% uh, uh, of the amateur radioactivity was in this HF range. And it wasn't until the advent of transistors, semiconductors, and other technology that allowed amateurs to use uh, the VHF frequencies. So uh, in fact, when I first got licensed in 1964, yes, I, I am that old, and it's probably obvious. <laughs> uh, most everything was still HF radio. And to us, of course, it was extremely exciting because you know you could communicate around the world when and um, you know when, when this was almost unheard of. You know, I mean, you couldn't pick up a phone and call, uh, you know, very easily to any place in the world. So even as a kid, you know, uh, people would come to my house and go, "Oh, you know, you're talking to China. You're talking to England." You're talking to, you know, Japan, South America, you know, and this was considered really almost a radical kind of a thing. And people were very excited about this. Um, I'll, I'll just take one second here to talk uh, about the emergency communications, because, you know, a lot of the folks now that are licensed are into emergency communications. In fact, the question came up, well, how does HF relate to emergency communications? Very, very strongly, uh, but perhaps in a different way than we might think. Um, generally, when you're using HF radio for emergency communications, you're talking more of a regional uh, approach and uh, you know, more for international disasters. I'll, I'll tell just a quick story here in a minute. Um, so it's kind of like the next level up, in fact, uh, uh, the Multnomah County Aries, that's one of the things that they're working on uh, exploring more. Because, for instance, if there was, let's just say, the big Cascadia earthquake, um, we might need to communicate with, uh, you know, British Columbia, you know, up in Washington. We might reach, you know, maybe California, maybe Utah, maybe even Washington, D.C. And if all the infrastructure is out, what's left? HF radio. Uh, so there's definitely a role for that. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a little uh, more technologically involved, but it's, it's not rocket science and, and, you know, many people enjoy it. So there is that aspect. In fact, uh, two years ago, um, a neighbor uh, uh, came over, knocked on my door, and she said, um, my parents live on an island uh, in the Caribbean, and there had just been, I forget which of the hurricanes, devastating hurricanes that, that, came, that came through. Uh, and in fact, uh, their island, which was called St. Bartholomew, um, <clears throat> was one of those that was seriously affected. She said, I have no way to get a hold of them. Uh, there's no phone service. There's no anything. Can you help? And I said, uh, let me see what I can do. Uh, so what I did uh, was uh, send a message through the uh, ARRL, what's called the National Traffic System. And it's actually a system that's been in place since the 1930s and is still very active today for communicating uh, over long distances, particularly emergency messages. Uh, in fact, a lot of the formats for emergency messages you might do as a, as a net or a cert, uh, all, many of those are modeled on the ARRL, uh, National Traffic System. Uh, so I said, let me get a message. And I said, do you have any, can you give me any information? She said, well, she said, I know that there is a, a ham on the island. And he's French because this was a French possession. Uh, it wasn't in a, you know, an American country. And I said, uh, can you give me a name or do you happen to have by chance a call sign? Well, she was able to dig that up. She had had that stored somewhere. Uh, and, and by the way, call signs for different countries, you know, uh, are not like uh, the US. Ah, perfect, the radiogram. That's, that's, it, and it kind of has that funky 1930s look to it that I think is just still really cool. Um, Anyway, so uh, being a French possession, his call started with uh, the letter F, 
not you know the the W, the K, the N that the Americans have, because F uh, F is in Frank is for all the French possessions and. France. So, if you know, this island was administered by France, so he had a call sign. Anyway, um, so we put that into the channels. The message was relayed to him, I think, from Florida by a ham using HF radio to this gentleman on St. Bartholomew, who erected a temporary wire antenna. That, and he was able to track down her parents, get the message back. And within 24 hours, now it's not instantaneous, but you know she was so relieved. And so there's there's a role for that. And through history, uh, amateur radio, uh, particularly HF radio, has been extremely important for uh, Arctic and Antarctic expeditions. Uh, in fact, uh, almost every country that is in Antarctica today has an amateur radio communication. Uh, uh, set up because they use that oftentimes as a secondary. Uh, and sometimes even primary satellites aren't available. So there's there's Antarctic stations from Korea, the United States, Russia, uh, Chile, uh, Argentina, Korea, all of the in Japan, all the other countries. They all have amateur radio operators. Um, so you know, I'm just sort of painting a picture here of HF and and, and that picture of what it's all about. Now, uh, as far as this for amateurs, um, you know, and like in my case, I've always been extremely fascinated with HF radio because, um, you know, being able to use a small unit in my house with a little wire antenna, you know, I can communicate halfway across the world. And to me, that's still a thrill. I mean, yes, you can do it with a cell phone, but you just can't pick up a cell phone and call randomly you know, to Australia, you know. So <laughs> um, anyway, so there's, there's, so that's part of it. In, in fact, one of my hobbies of the, around this is what's called DXing. DXing means distance. And, you know, it's kind of a contest. It's not exactly a contest. I guess you could call it that. It's a, kind of a lifetime thing. Uh, there's what are considered about 300, I think, and I'm going to be guessing here, I think around 325 entities around the world uh, that, you know, we might normally call countries are not all separate individual countries. Uh, but the goal is to try to contact all of those uh, entities, you know, on HF radio. And you win some awards and sometimes it's really difficult to get these. Uh, a great example of that, there's an island that is probably the most remote island on, on planet Earth. It's called Bouvet, B-O-U-V-E-T. And uh, it's in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, not too far north from Antarctica. It's a French possession again, I think. I think it's French or Norwegian. Perhaps it's Norwegian. Uh, and about once every three or four years, uh, it will send what's called a de-expedition, kind of a play on words, where people will raise, you know, in many cases, like a million dollars. In this last one, uh, they, they hired a special uh, sailing vessel, and they sailed for like three weeks, I think, from Chile, you know, into the middle of the Atlantic Ocean with helicopters, loaded equipment on helicopters, landed on the island, set up a station for two weeks. And I think they were like, oh, I don't know, maybe 100,000 contacts, you know, over a two week period. And of course there's ice storms. There's, you know, <laughs> maybe native wildlife. Yeah, here's some wonderful pictures of, right. of these cards and images. So this is just one aspect. Um, yeah, and I've worked, I've had the good fortune to work with some of these contacts and some of these cards as well. Um, so there's that aspect of it. Uh, there's also a national aspect where uh, you know a lot of us work within the United States and we're trying to work you know other people. I regularly work people up in you know the East Coast in Maine. Um, one other aspect that I, I've gotten into over the past three or four years that I love 
combines outdoor hiking and activity uh, with HF radio. And actually, we do it a lot with VHF as well, and it's called SOTA, Summits on the Air. And uh, this started in England. And basically, the idea is that you're taking a very small portable radio uh, onto a mountaintop and then trying to work as many people as you can, uh, you know, all over the country, all over the world. Uh, and it's just kind of a really a neat thrill. You know, I have a very small compact radio. In fact, I think Max showed a slide of that radio earlier. Um, yes, yes, this one down here, the, the KX2 uh, by Elecraft. And it's, it's an amazing unit. Uh, it's not particularly cheap, but it's a wonderful radio. And I've had the good fortune to work New Zealand, Japan, uh, a number of places while, you know, running uh, very low power, you know, on a summit with simple antennas. So, you know, it's not like you're stuck in your basement anymore. So um, anyway, um, and there's, there's so many little uh, subsections of HF radio. Oh, uh, and the one last thing, and then I'll maybe open it up for some questions. Uh, one of the things that is different about HF radio from VHF radio is the modes that we use. In other words, most of your VHF communication uh, that you're doing for emergency services like is FM, you know, frequency modulation. Uh, and it's perfect for that two meter thing. On HF, we're using uh, actually three modes. We're using uh, two voice modes, which are uh, AM, uh, you know, just like the old AM radio stations. That's actually making quite a big comeback. Uh, we're using single sideband, which is a modified form of AM that's much more efficient that was started in the 1950s. And then uh, many of us, myself included in Max, uh, uh, we're, we're sort of throwbacks. We're using uh, Morse code, CW. In fact, CW has exploded in popularity uh, because it's a very simple mode to use. You can have very simple radios with low power because it's extremely efficient. It is the original digital mode, uh, you know. And, it, and so it, the, in technical terms, the signal to noise ratio between a CW transmitter and a, a voice transmitter is uh, really amazing. In other words, five watts of Morse code is equivalent to a hundred watts of voice. And therefore, if you're gonna throw a radio in a backpack, you know, and hike up to some place, instead of having a whole a big heavy 100 watt radio and a big heavy battery, you're taking a, a simple one. Um, and the other part now that is really uh, hopped up in the past few years are, are some really exciting and interesting digital modes for HF radio. And one that you may hear a lot of is FT8. Uh, some of the ones that have been around before uh, are you know, PSK 31. In fact, I just heard a show on it today that it's actually still quite active, even though it's 20 years old, which is old for a digital mode. And so uh, you've, you've got a lot of variety and a lot of uh, interest in it. There's also, in fact, a subset of people who, who do what they call slow scan TV, where they send television images on HF radio uh, all over. So. Uh, as with many parts of this hobby, you can you can get into uh, all kinds of little alleyways and twists and turns. Yeah, here's some great stuff from the SSTV world. And in fact, uh, uh, I believe some of the astronauts even used some of that from uh, the space shuttle. They weren't using HF radio, but they were using the slow scan TV technology. Um, and I've had over the years some very interesting conversations. Uh, it's, you know, I'm, it's a little bit dated now, but I used to back in the 60s and 70s regularly communicate with people from the USSR in Cuba, you know, which at those times were kind of forbidden, but we would have conversations and exchange information. And, and it was sort of a, you know, uh, maybe a little bit of a gateway into a different culture and a different community. Um, so that's, 
I probably talked enough for now about HF radio. We we haven't really got into the equipment or antennas as much, um, but uh, that just sort of gives you the brief overview. Um, so at this point, maybe, I don't know, Max, do we have any questions in the chat or if there's other folks that have questions, maybe we can answer them. Yeah, none in the chat, but uh, we can open it up to questions at this time. It's sure. such a broad topic that um, yeah, probably yeah. best just to find out what people want to know. Right, right. <coughs> so does anybody have any questions about HF radio or antennas? Um, or maybe you could just tell us where you are in getting into HF radio or if it <coughs> interests you. Oh, I so, think there's some stuff in the chat. Is there? Yeah. What, what do we got there? So uh, can you speak specifically on HF that text can do? I, 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 you broke up. What, or, oh, you... uh, HF radio uh, that techs, technicians are allowed to use. Oh, okay. Um, and part of that is the frequency range. Um, and I know it recently changed again, uh, but there's a fair amount of privileges for techs even on HF. Um, you know, um, <laughs> let's see here on some of the bands. No, so I can. Go ahead. I was, was going to say, I can answer that a little bit. Um, so unfortunately, I, and this has been something that um, AWRL and some other people have been trying to change with the FCC um, to give technician class licensees a little bit more uh, privilege on HF bands. But right now, uh, technicians have um, a small section of 80 meters down here with the squiggly lines. And those squiggly lines mean CW only. So 80 and 40 for technicians mm -hmm. um, and a little bit of 15. Um, and then finally you get some phone privileges, which is the yellow band right here on 10 meters. And then you also have Iridian data on 10 meters. Right. And the right. unfortunate part is that right now, 15 and 10 meters aren't great bands because of propagation, but 40 and 80 are actually great bands. Um, unfortunately, technicians, they're really limited to CW only. And there, there is a lot of push to get technician privileges, uh, even on just using data, um, to enjoy some of the other modes that people like uh, to do, um, like specifically FT8 and other similar digital modes. Um, right. The concept behind or the reason why it's the general license that opens everybody up to the HF bands is called incentive licensing with the idea that uh, it gives you an incentive to upgrade to general at least um, to get more frequency privileges. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll address two other things here real yeah. quick. One uh, is <laughs> the whole thing with propagation and what that means. Um, in case you're not familiar, you may be familiar with the fact that the, there is a sunspot cycle that is roughly 11 years in duration. It does vary. That's just a real generalization. And basically, as the cycle and the count of sunspots increases, uh, the availability and ease of communicating over long distances also increases. So in other words, if you have a peak sunspot cycle or at the peak of a sunspot cycle, you'll find you'll be able to communicate over much longer distances with much greater ease as opposed to the trough, the bottom of the cycle. Doesn't mean you can't. Um, it just takes a little more perseverance. Uh, what was it about six months ago? I managed to connect with uh, one, uh, what I was talking about was a DX petition to an island called South Sandwich Island, which is probably five miles across. And a bunch of crazy guys, hands with money and so forth, decided, yeah, we're going to take an icebreaker down there and set up on the island, put antennas. And I managed to work them on uh, the 30 meter band, which you might see in this, this one here. Uh, it is only uh, a Morse code and RTTY and data. Uh, only, and uh, but I managed with very low power to communicate, you know, almost halfway around the world. So uh, just even at, at the bottom of the cycle doesn't mean you can't use it. You just have to be a little craftier, you know. Uh, 
Um, so uh, Stevie Ray asked if that um, technicians can do FT8 on 10 meters. And as far as I know, uh, the answer is yes. I have not personally done it. Uh, and for those of you who are wondering what FT8 is, think of uh, uh, Morse, the advantages of Morse code to be able to communicate uh, around the world with very little power, um, but without having to learn the Morse code. So it's a digital mode that uses a computer. Um, so it's a lot like chat, except for um, you don't have the internet. You just have the two computers separated by radio waves. That being said, unfortunately, 10 meters, uh, probably even with FT8, isn't going to get you very far, uh, even using FT8. Uh, yeah, the cycle uh, is improving. So over the next few years, you will see openings on 10 meters. In fact, I, I've experienced some openings on 10 of late. So things are, are perking up there. This, this is a really good time to get interested in HF radio um, because conditions will, will do nothing but improve. Um, now, just talking about equipment, uh, you know, Max. Hey, Dan. Oh, yes. I think we have a question from Steve and free ALS. Sure. Go ahead, Steve. Oh. Hey, I appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, oh, sure. The question that I have is, um, is there a better entry level HF frequency um, when, you know, when just getting into HF, sure. you know, 10 meters over 60, over 20, is, is there right. better? And I guess I would specifically ask about voice. Oh, okay. Uh, if, you, if you're doing voice, I would say probably the two bands that you would want to focus on, and actually the, the same would be for Morse code if you chose the both bands, would be 20 meters and 40. That's where you're going to find the most activity. Um, you know, and, and there would be segments there for, for both voice and most of the other modes. And those, those bands are, regardless of the sunspot cycle, those are always going to be the two most popular bands that you're going to use. You can pretty much get on 40 meters or 20. The 20 is more of a daytime band. Uh, but 40 meters can be 24 hours at various times. You can almost always get on there and rustle up some kind of a contact. So uh, Lee asked uh, if repeaters are used on HF bands like they are in VHF, UHF. Um, no, with one qualification. Of course, it's always, I'd say most always not. There is a, a, a segment of people on 10 meters and six meters that are using repeaters for FM. Uh, there, uh, of course, things are a little different because uh, I, I actually had a radio that did 10 meter FM uh, back at the peak of the sunspot cycle. And I would hit a repeater in Texas. And, and that repeater was retransmitting down into the Caribbean. And then, uh, so, you know, the. It, it, it can happen and it probably will come back again. And, uh, you know, although it's a little hard to find a 10 meter FM radio, uh, but for all the other things, no, it's, it's pretty much a direct point to point uh, communication. One of the things that does happen a lot on HF radio are nets, you know, where stations gather for all kinds of purposes. Uh, for instance, I know uh, who was a Neil earlier said that he's a, sa he's a sailor. There's a whole net on that goes 24 hours a day on 20 meters, 14.313, uh, strictly for sailors, so people sailing all over the world. And uh, recently there was, in fact, a medical emergency for a ship uh, where a guy, I forget what the medical emergency was, but the only means of communication was HF radio. He got on the 14313 frequency, put out a call, and they were able to, you know, rescue or help him with the medical emergency in pretty short order. So there's sailors nets, there's, uh, there's folks that are doing airplane mobile, <laughs> there's uh, uh, all kinds of nets uh, of, infinite number of, there's weather nets, uh, there's computer, you know, there's an international Linux users net 
uh, you know, on and on and on. So there's no end of, of groups that gather uh, on HF, you know. Uh, so Stevie Ray asks, um, uh, what can we do on 10 meters? Uh, what is SSB and what does phone mean? Oh, okay. Yeah, phone and SSB, you kind of used interchangeably. They're the same thing. Single sideband uh, is a voice mode. Um, it may be a, an easy way to think of it. If you think of AM radio, like your typical AM radio, would technically be what we would call a double sideband. So in order to make uh, that mode more efficient, uh, starting uh, back popularly in the 1950s, uh, radio manufacturers started developing what they call single sideband, where they sort of cut the signal in half and the receiving radio supplied part of that information to make the voice intelligible. And as a result, um, the, the reason they did that was two things, because the single sideband uh, is a much narrower um, spectrum, user of spectrum, so it can fit in a much smaller space. So in other words, you could put a lot more single sideband stations into you know, a 10 or 20 kilohertz section and you could AM stations and also it had much more efficiency than AM. If it had, you know, the, the power ratio and efficiency it would go much farther. So yeah, we tend to use phone and SSB interchangeably, you know, that's a sort of like old habits die hard, but uh, those are basically voice. Um, yeah, and I think it's, it's interesting that on the um, frequency band plan that the ARRL publishes, the, what we're displaying here, um, the only yellow on there is a single sideband phone. And that's just because the technicians are limited to single sideband only. Yeah. Um, whereas the green is phone and image, which means that you can use AM, FM, uh, single sideband. Um, most people use the most popular single sideband though in the, yeah. in the green yeah. sections. Yeah. Hey, Max. And, yeah. I have a question on on that chart that you are showing, which is pretty recent. I recognize because there are the twenty two hundred meters band. Uh, I don't see any more CW on ten meters. It's just a printing error, or I thought that the technicians had the CW uh, privs so, on ten meters. Yes, on in the red there, uh, it's Radian data, so they can use uh, CW FT eight ready. But you can see that in other in other bands that the CW is called separately. Yeah, that's because they're not allowed to use FT8 or RIDI. It's only Morse code. Mm -hmm. uh, so and, it's, it's just, part of the old incentive licensing. Yeah, and and uh, just to clarify, you know, the chart may not show that on any of these HF bands you can use the uh, CW on any of the frequencies. It's it's usable. Uh, over the entire bandwidth. Most people stick to the sections that are outlined in here with, with pretty oh. good reason. Oh, but, look at that. It's uh, right, uh, right there, the first note on the key. It says, yeah. note, CW operation is permitted throughout all amateur band. Okay. Yeah, and in fact, um, when I was a kid, and it still happens occasionally, I was, too, I was like a teenager and I couldn't afford a fancy SSB radio. So I didn't have any voice modes. But I would get on to the SSB frequencies and, and talk to guys. You know, I would use Morse code and they would respond in, in, in single sideband and voice. And I carried on actually a fair number of conversations that way. And, and Paul, uh, you had a question? Yeah, I'm wondering how uh, HF might fit into a mobile radio situation if you wanted to do some overlanding uh, forest road stuff where you could be in the mountains and you may not even have access to UHF, VHF repeaters. Uh, does it have much utility there? Oh, yeah. Uh, it, you know, uh, yeah. it does. And what it's called uh, is called uh, Near Vertical Incident Skywave. NVIS, isn't that an impressive sounding acronym uh, or an acronym, an acronym, something else? But what, in fact, this was pioneered by the military, and they discovered that when they were back, you know, in the early 2000s, and particularly like in Afghanistan, uh, they could not communicate, you know, from one 
valley to the next valley over that might be 40, 50 miles away. The VHF, UHF radios were useless because of the peaks, but they were able to use HF radio and the antenna configuration is a little bit specific, but it's not, it's not overly complex or overly difficult. And it allows you to bounce the signal at a high angle, a very high angle, and it comes down at a very, so a very steep angle, and it comes down relatively close. Uh, and now this has also been adopted by many uh, uh, emergency communications groups. So for instance, Oregon uh, you, you know, has some folks that are uh, doing as part of the emergency communications, what's this type of propagation. So for instance, if Portland had to communicate to Ashland, let's say, or down to the coast, you could use this mode where an FM or portable you know, VHF, UHF radio may not make it, but the NVIS would. Uh, and what's interesting is that the antennas are usually very low to the ground, um, you know, and it doesn't always require a lot of power. So yeah, there would be there would be some definitely some some advantages to that. So in that case, you would carry an antenna with you and stop your vehicle and bring the antenna out to make the communication. Is that correct? You could, or in fact, uh, the military pioneered now a number of people who use those. They developed some antennas to mount uh, on, uh, you know, like would mount on a roof rack. Okay. Uh, as opposed to a vertical configuration or more of a horizontal configuration uh, okay. that you could use. And uh, yeah, and yeah, actually, there's probably some pictures here. Uh, some of these are more vertical, but I've seen a lot. You may have seen the antennas that will come up and then do a 90 degree bend over the front of the radio. And um, those those are, are often used. Yeah, there is, there's definitely a, a, a use for that. And I think emergency communications folks would be very interested if people were using it for mobile applications. And a lot of uh, oh, me, a lot of radios now, um, they, they work off of 13.8 volts. Uh, so if it's not too large, uh, oftentimes you can just mount an HF radio in your truck or in your car. Um, it's not as common as using HF radio at home, but it's certainly done. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a number of, of, of you know, really nice little mobile. The, the challenge with HF is the size of the antenna. Well, and if you're using uh, NVIS, you're actually better off with a, a fairly short and a fairly low antenna, believe it or not. You don't need or don't want a big antenna, um, you know, if you're doing that kind of a mode, because it actually has a lower angle of takeoff and takes you a lot longer distance. So, you know, it's sort of a, a bit counterintuitive, but it kind of depends upon you know, if you're trying to do HF radio over a long distance, yeah, you're going to need a pretty big, long whip antenna. But if you're doing NVIS, you would actually use a shorter and differently oriented uh, antenna. So it's certainly a possibility. And yeah, here's a number of mobile. And so, and a lot of these radios are no bigger than, you know, the commercial yeah. tuning radios that we use, where they even combine. So... That, that is definitely an option. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about the uh, FT891, which can go up to 100 watts. It's right. mobile, but it might make a good transitional uh, bench top and mobile, you know, together. Yeah. It gets really good reviews on uh, good filters and uh, very good for clean CW as well. So. Yeah, yeah. No, I've, I've heard excellent things. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, all self-contained package of a 100 watt radio. You know, I think that's a very good option. Um, you know, the Elecraft radios are also great for that, except their only drawback uh, for some of the small ones is you would need an additional power amplifier because the radio itself is only, you know, a few watts. So. Oh, you're talking about like the KX, uh, the KX2? Yeah, KX2 or KX3. Oh, and then put an amplifier on it? Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. which a lot of guys do. And, you know, you could, you're pretty small now, right. uh, the amp, so that's also an option. But, you know, 
if you wanted to do it all self-contained, I think the 891 is a great choice. I, I think that's, and they're, they're, you know, Yesu makes excellent radios too. And then um, Steve had a question. I'm sorry, it's not Sam. Uh, Sam. Is he still with us? Go ahead. Sam. Uh, oh, here's, here's what, I don't know if we. Oh. I was trying to switch to my other device so I could hear better. Oh. Uh, oh. I was actually going to ask you, uh, between the KX2 and KX3, if you could talk a little bit about some of the differences. I was thinking about buying the sure. KX3. Uh, and to show you the kind of guy I am, I have both. <laughs> I probably shouldn't. Um, the basic, basic difference is uh, the KX3 is a little larger. It performs a little bit better. Um, it covers a wider range of frequencies. Um, for me personally, though, I also have the KX2. I find myself, whenever I'm going out to any kind of mobile or portable operation, I almost grab the KX2 because it's like 95% of the radio of the KX3 in about half the size. And it's, it's also uh, with the internal battery I find it a much more flexible unit in terms of, you know, taking it to the field. And again, the KX3 is a, is a superb radio. You know, there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, it's just a little bit bigger. It, it, you can kind of do some internal batteries, but it's not as flexible as the KX2. But the KX3 is, you know, basically what I do is I use the KX3 on home radio where it performs outstanding. Um, but for instance, if you stumbled across, let's say somebody had a used KX3 that was a great price, uh, you know, and you thought, wow, that would be it. You know, it's not going to be a major difference and it's probably going to be, you know, a, a great radio, uh, yeah, if you were just starting out. Yeah, I would say that the, the other kind of major differences, and it just depends on what your, your plan is for HF radio, the KX3 uh, has the capability to do 160 meters and six meters. Um, I don't, the KX2, does it do six meters? No, it just does 8310. Okay. And I might talk about that. I mean, uh, and this came up in a discussion the other day, uh, 160 meters is on the very low end of the HF spectrum and six is on a very high end. Uh, and they're great bands. Uh, they tend not to get much use or and there tends to be not a lot of activity overall. There are sp certain specific times. Uh, but for instance, if I'm going out in the field, I'm almost never working 160 or six meters because they kind of require special specialized antennas um, and a little bit of you know cooperation amongst for uh, activities and getting people on the air. But you know I can get on. Uh, 40 meters, 20 meters, anytime, you know, and there's always plenty of people to work. Um, and the other uh, big difference, and it depends on, you know, if you need this or not, but the PX3, which is the pan adapter that you see there in the middle, um, will show you a graphical display of, uh, and a waterfall display uh, right. of activity around, you know, in, in a wide spectrum of band. The KX2 is not able to connect to the PX3. The, the KX3 is. Um, so the PX3, uh, it's surprisingly not very expensive um, considering, you know, $500 for an additional, additional display. Um, but that's just uh, one other major difference. Yeah, and I, I do use the KX3 and PX3 at home and it's a superb radio. And you could, you know, easily make it pretty portable too. So, yeah. I mean, it was designed with portability in mind, but then they, you know, I, I happen to know the guys that run Alicraft and I've known them for a long time. And, and that's why I spent so much money, <laughs> but they do make wonderful radios, but they're, they're kind of like, you know, they're always going, well, gee, what could we do to make it a little smaller, a little more compact and still get almost, a, almost the same performance out of the radio. And so they keep shrinking the radios and, you know, I have a very small little go bag 
that's ready to go away. I have a complete HF station in a very small camera bag that I can just grab and go with the KX2 antenna, battery, extra battery packs and all the information. So and in terms of that, would what size external battery would you throw in that? And then also I had heard you can add two meters to the KX3? Yes, you can. Uh, they do make a two meter module, and uh, which I did go ahead and put in mine. And that, that can be very useful, you know, if you're going to be out in the field. If you were going to say, gee, I just kind of want to have one radio that would do two meters through all those frequency ranges, uh, you know, that would be a really good option as well. But, so, but the two meter the two meter module is limited in power right oh yeah yeah uh, it's it's about two or three watts but you know i mean if a handheld is five watts the difference between you know three watts and five watts you know that's okay but it's not equivalent to two <laughs> uh uhf vhf a mobile radio so no that's true that's true but yeah uh, and the other question uh, Sam oh, had was, uh, what battery would you use? Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, now the KX2 comes with internal lithium ion batteries and I, I keep a spare and it, you know, it's, I'm not always running high power, obviously. Well, the, the KX2 only gets 10 watts. I usually run mine at five and, uh, you know, I, I can run easily four to six hours operating on the one battery. And if I need another one, I just swap out the identical battery. You know, so I'm and good. If the KX3, I was asking what size uh, to do oh. maybe soda and POTA activations. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, uh, some of the bioenos up here, like the, uh, let's see, I can't quite see clearly. I would say like what a uh, like the six or eight amp hour batteries. Yeah, so this this one here is uh, this has nine, but it's about the same size as uh, the six amp hour yeah, battery. Yeah. There you go. That's the six amp hour. Yeah, and and that's what I've used, you know, and I use that very successfully with the KX3, you know, to to power. And it depends on how how long, because uh, the three amp hour is like half the size of the six amp hour, and I, I've used that for a few hours also. So, and then uh, Steve, he has a question that um, do they make dual tri quad band HF radios? Um, and I, th I think they said that, you know, the, the KX3 covers the 60 meter, uh, which leads to his next question uh, Would you need a different antenna for each band? Oh, I, I think you're breaking up there, Max. Oh, uh, so I, the base question is uh, Do you need a different antenna for each different band? Okay, I think you're asking about antennas. Yeah, and uh, my, almost all of the HF radios uh, cover most of the HF spectrum, so it's different from the FM units. And saying two or three band, most all of the radios you find are going to cover either 80 through 10 meters or 160 through 10 or 160 through six meters. So if you're getting an HF radio, almost always it's going to cover all of the active HF bands. So you don't have to invest. You know, antennas, okay. Let's see, we got, how many hours do we have? We've got 20 <laughs> minutes left. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Antennas are one of the things of endless study and fascination. And a lot of it depends upon what you're trying to do. Um, many of us um, have tried to develop antenna systems that are flexible, that allow for use on multiple bands. Um, you know, ideally, if you were living in an ideal world and had all the money you wanted to spend, and there are guys out there and you'll see installations like that, they have separate antennas for each band and giant antennas. Now, most of us don't have the real estate or the money, the time or the energy. So we, we use uh, uh, a lot of, lesser antennas, one that I use for my home, and I know some of the other guys do, is what's called in, uh, uh, it's called a, a, a double-ended ZEP antenna. Now, ZEP, what do you mean by that? Well, Zeppelin. And where that comes from is a historical reference 
uh, to back in the old days of the German Zeppelins, they developed this type of antenna that they could trail outside of the Zeppelin and would be uh, used uh, for a lot of frequencies. Yeah, and here's, here's the picture. And what it is, like you see this, the one picture right up on there, uh, you basically, it's a wire antenna. So you have equal lengths of wire on each side. And then if you'll notice in the middle, there is a thing that says open wire feed line. This is not coax. This is not coax cable. Uh, and the reason for that is the open wire feed line uh, allows you a great deal of flexibility to retune the antenna on many bands. Uh, oftentimes you'll see it called ladder line or it, which is slightly different or open wire line. But in terms of basic HF antennas, this is the one that will give you the most flexibility. Uh, the, and you know, what you're trying to do is put up an equal length of wire on each side. The difference between that and a dipole, and it is a difference you want to try to be aware of, a dipole is cut for a specific frequency and it is fed with coax. So in other words, if you put up a 40 meter dipole, it's really only going to be good for 40. It's not gonna be good for any other band. Uh, but if you use this double extended zip with the open wire feed line, you can basically get as much wire up in the air as you can reasonably get. Uh, which you know is going to be different for everyone, but even fairly short lengths will work fairly well, as long as it's equal on both ends. Then you use the ladder line or open wire line. Then you would the the, uh, the one difference between that is you would need a tuner, generally a specific type of tuner, to uh, allow that antenna system to match with your radio. Uh, and uh, there are some new, you know, in the old days, yeah, these were, these are ones that we use a lot. They're called Johnson matchboxes. You know, they, they're like 1950s science fiction things and they're still great, we use them. But there are brand new alternatives. MFJ makes a very nice, uh, you know, new version of a matchbox tuner. And uh, that allows you to get on a lot of bands. Uh, so that's, you know, I, I often start and recommend people look at that option if they're interested in a variety of bands. And, you know, I mean, we can go on and on. There's all kinds of variations of antennas. There's verticals, there's, you know, there's beams, there's, you know, it, it, there's thousands of books written on antenna theory, types of antennas or each. Uh, and it's all so, good. And it's uh, we're all still learning a lot uh, as we go. Uh, but, you know, for just your basic use, a, this, this is a, a good antenna system. So uh, Sam asks, uh, what would be an ideal Soda, Soda antenna for the KX3? Uh, I, well, I'm sorry. I oh, what's an ideal antenna for Soda and Poda? Oh, yeah. Um, a lot of that depends upon, you know, erect how easily you want to put up. I use uh, a couple different things. I always have two or three options. The, the one I use a lot is a simple vertical antenna. This is one that Elecraft sells. It's called the AX1. It's a small vertical and it is not the most efficient antenna, but it is very quick and very easy to erect. Um, and with care and with some additional work, uh, I've had really good success with them. You, you know, there, you have to kind of get to know the antenna and get to know the situation, um, in order to maximize the efficiency. Uh, the other option is the NFED and there's two varieties of NFEDs. And this can often be a bit of confusion. There's the NFED random wire, which we're showing here. And then there's the NFED half wave. And what's the difference? Well, the half wave uh, is really only good for one or maybe two frequencies, but it is very good for those frequencies. Uh, but it's not as flexible in terms of retuning to other frequencies as the NFED random wire. They both require some sort of what is known as a counterpoise or a radial 
which is you have the antenna wire and then you want to get that up as high as you can, uh, either in a tree or on a pole, something of that nature. Then your counterpoise is a wire that uh, it can even be thrown on the ground. It works a little bit better if you elevate it slightly a few feet off the ground um, and have it usually at a quarter wavelength of the frequency that you want, it would be ideal. And if you can put two or three more radials out, you'll just improve the efficiency of the antenna. Um, but those are probably the two most common ones. Uh, me being kind of an antenna nut, I experiment with a lot of different things. I've also had a lot of luck and, and fun in a weak pocketbook <laughs> from messing around with a loop, magnetic loop antennas. Uh, magnetic loop antennas kind of fall into a category all by themselves. And uh, they are very interesting. They're very small. They're very compact. They do not require a, a lot of, you see, this is what, four or five feet off the ground. Uh, you know, and they're, they're a little finicky in terms of tuning and adjusting, but they are very portable and can be extremely effective antennas. They're not as much of a compromise as you might think. If, if you get comfortable using those, they can be very effective because they combine both high angle of radiation and low angle. In fact, you know, I've worked consistently in the New Zealand and Japan on five watts with mag loop radios. Um, if you're a really good builder, a pretty experienced home brew type person, you can build uh, a loop antenna it, it's a little tricky. Uh, the commercial ones tend to be pretty expensive, three, three to five hundred dollars. So you know it isn't probably something you would want to run out and grab as your first antenna. Uh, you know you'd want to experiment, borrow one, uh, kind of get used to it. Yeah, here's some more good pictures. And yeah, this, this I have two different ones. I have the Alex Loop. This is one uh, pioneered by Brazilian ham, and I have another one. Unfortunately, that seems to be out of production right now, which is the W4OP loop, which I really like. It's not as portable as the Alex loop. The Alex loop is really nice because it's extremely portable. And the nice, the nice thing about loop antennas is, is that you're not looking for a tree or a big pole. You know, you're 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 pretty portable. You can throw it up somewhere and be somewhat unobtrusive. And it always gets interesting comments, you know, from folks walking by. So Steve, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Paul asked if um, if you're going to have a Telecraft <coughs> KX2 or KX3, right. um, would you use the Telecraft amplifier or one of the cheaper options, like the cheaper amplifiers? Um, well, if I it would depend if I was going to do portable work or not. Um, the Elecraft amplifiers are definitely excellent amplifiers, but they're not as efficient for portable or mobile use. There's a couple other ones. There's, what's the one? Uh, I think it's called the Hard Rock 50. Is that ring a bell, Max? Uh, I think it's called. I do know that. Um, um, and that's, that's one that I, a couple of guys have used in some of those kits. Yeah. And these, these are fairly, some of them are. And Matt, there's a picture of one with a KX3 there. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I do know that um, uh, there are some that are sold by um, some of the Chinese imports. Uh, Radio Diddy uh, sells one. I don't think they sell it anymore just because it got such horrible reviews um, yeah. and amplifiers yes they're expensive but it's probably one of the places that you don't want to um, skimp out on too much yeah the hard rock hard rock has gotten excellent reviews and uh, i believe it may be a kit or maybe available kit or assembled and you know for portable use i think it's gotten really pretty good uh reviews and accept and it does I think interface pretty well with you know the KX2 and the KX3. The one thing to keep in mind is if you're going to do uh, the official uh, summits on the air or parks on the air you are limited to five watts 
um, which both the KX2 and the KX3 can do. Um, you could certainly carry up a 100 watt radio or a, or a low power radio with a 100 watt amplifier. Um, there's nothing wrong with that, uh, but it may get kind of heavy in the backpack. Actually, actually, you know, I mean, there's no power limit on soda or Poda. Oh, I yeah. thought there yeah, was there on soda. It, it, it okay. amazing enough. I always thought there was. <laughs> You know, and I just do, I just, that's my own personal habit is I use QRP, I use five watts and I'm probably always handicapping myself even a little more, but uh, I don't know if you know, Scott KI7EMX, I don't know. He's done a ton of soda activations, but uh, yeah, he uses the hard rock and, you know, he'll run 50 or 75 watts. Yeah, I'm thinking for a uh, truck and bench top combination, mostly. If, if backpacking, I probably wouldn't bring an amplifier. Right. No, I think I think I would give some serious consideration to look at the hard rock versus the uh, the Elecraft. I mean, the Elecraft stuff is, of course, a wonderfully made, you know. And, 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 you know, I would just sort of look at the, you know, what the price options and size and kind of give those some consideration because I, I don't think you could go wrong. Either one. Yeah, it looks like uh, three hundred dollars <throat> will get you. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Probably what fifty watt. Yeah, I think it's okay. yeah. So yeah, so add a grand for the other craft and another fifty watts. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but you have the pleasure of the other. <laughs> yeah. Oh uh, boy, yeah. There. If I had a year to under my belt, I might go with the buy once that idea, but I'm not sure right now. Right, exactly, exactly. So, I'd like to just make a quick comment. Yeah. I was thinking about buying radios. There was a fire in Japan, I think it was October, at a major chip factory. And a lot of the radios can't be built because there was like almost a single source for some of the key chips for some of these radios. So you may find them hard to find. And, yeah. uh, and, and, if the, and it, some of the sellers are starting to do market pricing where something was $1,000 a month ago. And now that they're so skim, they're, they're adding, you know, prices are going up on some of this stuff. So do your shopping. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, I, here's Ham Radio Outlet and none of their outlets have the 891. Uh, I think they're also out of a lot of the other popular radios. Like yeah. the 400 XDR. Yeah. Just kind of a heads up yeah. on it. It may be difficult to find yeah. the ones you want. And if you can wait however long for these chips to manufacturers to get back caught up, uh, might it might be worth their time and money. Yeah. Uh, which sort of brings around one other comment, which is uh, uh, you know, generally speaking. Uh, when you're starting out, you don't really need a lot of the capabilities of the newest HF radios. They're nice to have, but uh, a used radio that's even 10 years old or so, when you're starting out at HF, is probably going to be more than adequate. And in fact, uh, it's a good way to go because it kind of gets you your foot in the door at a low cost and kind of gets you up and running. And uh, you don't have to lay out a big investment. In fact, if some of the radios are hard to get, and this is a generalization, so take it as a generalization. But as a generalization, most hams take really good care of their equipment. And I would say most of the used radios out there, you're gonna find are in pretty good shape. You know, there are, there's gonna be the exceptions to the rule and as the older the radio, the more issues it may have. Um, but, you know, uh, I also, I also like to add that never underestimate the asking around. Maybe some other people around you have radios they don't use and they will be willing to lend you for a while until you get your feet uh, wet and you understand what you want. It, that's, that's an excellent idea. You know, many of us have all too many radios, myself included. And, and one of the things that Max was alluding to is I have a basement full of what I what we affectionately call boat anchors. Uh, 
And I, I still use these radios. They're tube radios, a lot of them from the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. And I absolutely love these radios, partially for the design, because they just look, you know, it's that, that old, you know, industrial uh, design thing from that period, you know, a little bit Art Deco. Uh, they've got big knobs. They've got big dials. They've got big meters. And as you get a little older, you know, sometimes those things are kind of fun. Having a little tiny knobs and a little, it can get a little, uh, silly. and the, the big old radios, you know, it's kind of like, um, you know, having a 1950s car, you know, you may not always be able to just hop in and turn the key. You know, you might have to check the oil, might have the batteries. Yeah, here's some great pictures. Uh, I have a radio, the one far right corner, or the far left-hand corner and the far right corner. I have, have uh, th those two uh, receivers. And I mean, and they work great. You know, they were like the top of the line radio from like early 1950s. And just, they're so cool looking. And when you fire those suckers up, the tubes light up, the dial lights up. Uh, there's a certain smell that happens, you know, because those old tubes heat up, uh, fills the room with heat on a cold night. <laughs> and, and they have this wonderful analog sound, you know, that it's just a joy to listen to. They're not as usable as the new radios. They're not as swift. You have to, you know, you have to get to know the radios. They're a little finicky. They're a little fiddly. They, you know, things go wrong with them. You got to be ready to repair them. Uh, but at least you can get in there and repair because the parts are big and you're not talking about surface mount stuff. And it's just a gas to use these old radios. When I was a kid, you know, I couldn't afford these radios, you know. So, you know, but they were the, you know, they were the Rolls Royces and the, uh, you know, the BMWs and Mercedes of the day, so to speak. And, you know, with tender loving care, they're, they're still really effective radio. So my, my latest one that I finally revived and maybe Max can put a picture of the Tentec Corsair II, which is a 1980s vintage. So, you know, that's that's been a lot of fun. The other thing, I, uh, and I'll pull up uh, yeah. there, I think that's. Yeah, I was just using this radio last night on the air. Yeah. And it's, it sure is fun. The other thing I want to point out is that um, before you buy a, a radio or actually any gear, um, if you want to find out what other people think about it, Eham, and there's some other places, but Eham is one of the more active ones. If you go under community, uh, and that's eham.net, and then you go to reviews here, um, they have all sorts of categories. So if you wanted to take a look at HF radios, that'd be down by uh, transceivers, HF, uh, six meters, um, non-QRP. And in here is a list of um, almost all the radios. And you can see that some of them, you know, they don't get good reviews. Uh, others get great reviews. So uh, take a look here. These are radio reviews that are um, usually by hams that have owned the radio for, uh, you know, anywhere from one day to uh, many years. Yeah. Oh, just to circle back quick on the boat anchor thing, by the way, just, uh, to clarify one thing, prior to like the late 1960s, all of the radios were separate. In other words, you had a separate transmitter and a separate receiver and a separate VFO control unit. So they take up a lot of space. But, you know, I figured when I fired those guys up, I've got about 23 tubes going all at once. <laughs> but it, and it makes it... Uh, quite an adventure so it's not like you turn it on and dial up the station and start working you know it, it, it uh, it's it's a little different experience but that's all that's and that's just one of my fun things that, and and now i i have some 1930s radios to restore and that's going to be another adventure i think max is seen i used to have the pictures up with the uh, the breadboard radio yes there was a, a comment that somebody wanted the um, email for uh, Hamcram, and I'm going to put that into yeah. the chat. Well, while he's doing that, I'll just mention what I mean by breadboard. In the 1930s Depression era, uh, they would use uh, 
you know, things were very scarce. People were poor, so they would maybe take an old bread, literally a breadboard, or the other one that they would use, they'd take an old cake pan and turn it upside down, punch holes in it, and that would be your radio chassis. And uh, in fact, there's a great YouTube video. Oh, boy, I wish we could put the link up on that. Uh, and I think I sent it to you a while back, Max, a week or two ago. I don't know if you can dig that one out. And it's a film from about, it's a short film about 15 minutes long from about 1938 or 1939 on the adventure of ham radio. And it shows the guy in his home, the young guy uh, communicating to a, uh, a biplane that is crossing the Atlantic Ocean in search of a sunk seaplane. And, you know, they're communicating using Morse code and, you know, and it's just, it's just the kind of the, the magic of radio. And, and you'll get to see some of the, you know, like they have the cake pan radio in there and some of those. It's just, it's just a lot of fun. It's a, it's a great little YouTube short. That's great. Yeah. I can't find it right now, but uh, we, we are kind of at the, the yeah, bottom of the end. hour. So, yeah. Um, can, they can just do a YouTube search on, you know, 1930s ham radio and it'll probably come up on YouTube. And it's, it's like a movie tone short or 15 minutes. It's great. Um, so Paul asked if it was just the tech class. Um, I believe actually he does general um, ham cram also. I don't think he does. Uh, I'm, well, I'm not sure if he does extra or not. Um, usually ham cram is a tech and general. So, but I would just contact him to find out. And then our upcoming classes, uh, our upcoming meetings, we have um, homebrew and kit building next week, and then WinLink, uh, and then a field day overview. So um, those are the topics that are coming up. I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. If you have any other questions, um, please feel free to uh, email them in uh, to me. Um, I had a couple people email some good topics. So if you have any questions, comments, or even feedback on these meetings, please uh, email me.